Hello, welcome to uh, Get the, the Fork Out. Uh, this week, we are going to talk to Peter Vogel. He is the, he's the expert of all interior service. Where am I going with this? How do I describe what Peter does? Peter is, uh, I might need to start this shit again. That sucks. Hello, welcome to uh, Get the Fork Out. Uh, this week we have Peter Vogel. He is the premier uh, service front of the house experts on, um, on in, in yachting. But I don't mean just like you know vaguely in the industry at the highest echelons of this industry that is massive and global. He is the dude. Uh, I've known him for a long time, and uh, it's cool to just watch his career flourish as well. He, so he's in in training is what I mean to say. He's no longer actually working physically as a steward on yachts anymore. He's uh, he's doing training and he's got his academy, um, LH. It's a group and they do a ton of different stuff, but specifically on training. So naturally we talk about training. Uh, I do apologize. There is a shitty connection on my end. So it gets broken up into, into two parts and uh, just be patient. Life on the run. I never know where I'm gonna be. And for a while I didn't have Wi-Fi, and I, every morning I'd hunt for Wi-Fi, And so this, this got broken up with that, but um, really good conversation, whether you are a um, steward, 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 stewardess or a steward or a chef, great conversation between the, the juxtaposition of the two things and the overall goal of providing service. And I hope you like it. Welcome to Get the Fork Out, everyone. Uh, this week we have the, uh, I think quite famous, I'm not saying that lightly, Peter Vogel uh, from LH, Luxury Hospitality. And uh, he's been in the industry a, a long time, as a vibe for about 20 years. And we're gonna talk about service and how it pertains to the industry now, what we've seen change, problem areas, sticking points that we've noticed from front of the house, back of the house, and then probably towards the end, get into a conversation about communication between front of the house and back of the house. Peter Vogel, welcome. Welcome to Get the Fork Out. Man, thanks for having me. I mean, this is, you know, it's quite a thing. I'm, uh, I'm well impressed that I got asked to be on this. So thanks very much for having me. Uh, you, you are welcome. You're one of the first names that popped into my mind as a I, I just think to, to communicate to two people from, from either side in the same industry that I've been doing in a while. I mean, we have so much knowledge between the two of us and let's have a conversation and, and record it. <laughs> yeah, no, bring it on. <laughs> you, you, be, you being in the morning and me going into the evening, it's uh, yeah. a, a challenge, but I'm sure we'll yeah, make it work. Let's start with that. Where, where, where are you exactly on the, in the planet? Uh, well, hey, because of the pandemic, no one's traveling. So uh, I'm in um, I'm in the Netherlands, and I'm very close to Rotterdam at the moment. Okay. So, I did a stage in Rotterdam. At, um, you did, you did. Uh, I remember very well. Actually, we didn't meet that time. Damn. <laughs> oh no, we met way before that in our lives. But uh, uh, I am in California, so the time difference is quite challenging. So a, a little backstory: Peter and I have been trying to set this up for weeks now. But between me moving and not having Wi-Fi, so that's why. I'm at a beautiful coffee shop, but it's a little bit inconvenient. I don't have my nice camera set up or the sound set up. It's just it's what I got to do for now. So it's a bit of a, like a, <laughs> these get the fork out. I was told they're a big gorilla where they're always probably going to be in a different location. Uh, it's all good. Good to see you, man. I'm glad we finally were able to make this work. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You know, you know, it's been interesting because every time it's so funny, my team watches my calendar, right? So I've had it in the calendar for what three weeks now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perpetually in the calendar. So every every day <clears throat> I've I've got a couple of people that are big fans of yours and they come from really? the chefing world and they're in my calendar. Mm. So every time they're like the next day, they're like asking me, So how was it? How was it? And I'm like, didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, bread and flaked out again. Yeah, what's <laughs> it's been a it's been a couple of things behind the scenes I, I won't get into now but yeah it's it's uh I'm glad to to finally connect and um we should we yeah. should start we should start we have a lot of 
of things to talk about. I think, I think one of the one a perspective that that you bring to the industry too is that I mean, when I met you, I think I met you probably like 10, 12 years ago, and, and you had already you already moved. Um, you weren't yacht crew anymore, but like your crewing career was quite illustrious. I mean, you worked on some of the best boats in the industry, and then you had changed into um, into doing education and training and. And that's how I think that's how we connected for the, for the first time. But I, I remember like when we first met, I think you were trying to get me a job on Serene as it was launching, you know, back in the day. And, and that was in Cannes. And that yeah. was a, that's my first memory of you. Yeah. So that, I, I guess the ago, question man. is, that's... I guess the question is like, have, have, have things changed? Let's just leave it a blanket open question. What, what have you noticed in the last 10, 20 years in the industry in terms of the larger yachts, the bigger programs? Have things changed? Yeah, I mean, yeah, things are changing all the time. Um, I think when, when, so when I joined your team was 97, right? Um, I okay. came from smaller cruise ships, which were the luxury ones, Seaburn and you know, we had 200 guests on a 144 meter cruise ship. Now, obviously, when I when I joined the industry, my first yacht was um, Lady Mora, which was a hundred and I don't know, six, seven, eight, whatever, I can't remember. But it was a big yacht at the time it was in the top three. And it was amazing. And yep. I was like, wow, yep. this is it. Um, it was very formal. Um, strict captain was clear about hierarchy and all that kind of stuff. And to be honest, it was fine because I came from cruise ships where it was the same. You know, yeah. it was structured, it was, it was fine, it was organized. Um, I, gosh, I did two and a half years on that boat, but, um, you know, if I look back now, did we give the absolute ult ultimate to that owner? I mean, that took us about six months to get there. I mean, you know, yeah. now I look back, I mean, and I look at the differences in these, in these, in the services around these boats, because since then, that was a Middle Eastern owner. I then worked for a Monogast owner, and then in the end, I worked for a, uh, an American owner for about 10 years. Um, so I always find that, has the service changed over the years? I don't think so. I think the service changes by nationality, by ownership. Um, you know, some owners do like, they really, and they enjoy their casual kind of approach to it. And some owners love the formal approach, but that's up to you and me to figure out as, as the uh, galley interior team so that we can really adjust it and, and, and make it work for them. Customize it. I don't think service in particularly changed because some of these formal owners are still out there. I mean, we, we train them, you know, constantly, uh, yeah. the crew around. So no, I don't think, I don't think anything particularly changed because of time. I think there but are most of are more, there are more owners now in like the millennial age. So they have changed. Yeah, I, I think two, two uh, points that, that I want to I want to talk about that you picked up is like in, in terms of what has changed in 20 years is like the size of the programs, like the, the size and the scope of the uh, management of the amount of crew that are on these large vessels. That's that's one huge point that over 20 years, the amount of larger boats has grown exponentially and it, it, it still seems to be ramping in that direction. Uh, and then the is. other point, the other point that I think touched on the kind of the heart and soul of this industry is that customizable service. You know, it isn't like uh, a three mission star where that is the service they provide. It's locked in stone that, you know, each, each boat can be locked in stone, but the, I think the heart and soul of this industry is to just cater directly towards people's needs. And I think on a charter boat, you do need to be a bit more like amalgamous. You, you gotta be able to change, uh, change your styles up completely. But I think that's a, those are two important points that, that you brought up that I, that I noticed. Well, I, I agree with you. The, the size is a massive thing. I mean, when I joined in 97, a 60 meter was a big boat. Yeah. Right. Um, and there weren't many of them. Well, there weren't many. And I was lucky that I, I ended up on a hundred meter plus, which was unheard of. Um, after that, I did my Monegasque experience, which was on a 55 meter. And I did that for two years, two and a half years. So, so I do know the difference between the sizes and, and I agree with you. I mean, obviously, in the beginning, a 60 meter boat was like fantastic. People loved it. And then all these owners that used to have their 60 meters are now on to like a 90 meter or 120 meter or, you know, 
it's right. it's common now you you yep. you're not you're not part of it anymore if you don't have a big boat <laughs> right yeah it's true it's true but but then the it's almost like a pyramid i want to say where, where like yeah you have the larger boats at the top but then the, the base has grown you know it's kind of come up like this where now there's hundreds if not thousands of 60 meters where they would have been the elite and the largest there's now and, and they're cool too i mean I, there's nothing wrong with that size but it's not just that there's the same amount of 60 meters as there was 20 years ago there's just it's exponential and so i think it's it, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we've done some research, obviously, because we want to keep on track with, you know, the 40 meters to 50 meters, the 50 to 60, the 60 to 70. Um, I mean, there are there are actually, I think it's 1800 right now of 60 meter uh, buses. I mean, it is, it's a phenomenal part of the industry. And um, yeah, it's huge. It's interesting because the difference between, and I remember this so well when, um, you know, I work, as you know, I work for uh, the late Mr. Allen, and when he 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 basically um, ordered his large yacht, the Octopus, and it became a massive boat, as we all know. It was one of the first. It was out there, and I do remember him saying, when we finally took possession of it, or he took possession of it, and he came on board, and all he was asking actually at the time was like, "Where is my where's Medus? Where's my sixty meter?" Uh, I've worked we, on Medusa for a while. There. We, we, had it, we had it around the corner. It was there, right? So we were like, well, it's, you know, it's here. And um, he, was, he was just uncomfortable about the size of the, of the yeah. boat and the crew and it not feeling the same as being in a port, right? Like then it was kind of That's the first massive. time he couldn't bring his boat. Yep. That is, that is massive, whether or not you're in port or not. And I think that's where, I don't know. I think maybe a, a new owner wouldn't know the difference between 60 meters to cut off and you're not going to get too many ports after that. A few, of course, yeah. but then your, your, your lifestyle yeah. changes. Then, then you're getting all dressed up and you're getting in a tender and it might be windy and it might be rainy rather than <laughs> stepping onto the dock. And it just depends on the owner and, and, and it impacts the chefs directly as well. It's like, if you're going to take on provisions on a dock versus taking on uh, you know, be a tender, then, and if you know that going in and then build a, Build a door into the water line so you can take on provisions efficiently instead of, yeah. But it's it's an interesting but, but, it's an interesting conversation that should be had by the but, yard. You know, <laughs> but Brendan, I was I was going to say, I mean, um, obviously we've all learned a lot since. I mean, this was mm. you know together with um, uh, Larry Larry Everson at the time, Rising Sun. This was all being built at the same time. These were the first big motherfuckers i mean they were yeah. ready to yeah. change the world they were there they, and they, they did. were trying things they were trying things that no one ever did now since then yeah. things have improved i don't think everything has improved i think there's still a lot to improve since i mean we both know that there are areas on the boats that the shipyards are not paying attention to i'm not blaming the shipyards i'm actually blaming the designers that are not willing to listen uh, yeah. to people like yeah. you or me, because there is so much we can improve for in the ultimate guest experience, you know, that, that experience that the guests will have, that's what this is all about. It's not about what the shipyard does or what the designer does or what you and I want. It's about yeah. bringing it together and then morphing yeah. into something that's going to make a difference. I, I think it's an important point that you just brought up. One of, one of the foundations of what I want to do with galley design as well is that like, uh, and I'm not blaming the shipyards. What I found fascinating with, with doing the, 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 the two massive refits and the two massive new builds that I've done is like the, the, the yards are hyper intelligent people. They're, they're amazing people, whether they're in Germany or, or Holland or, or Italy, wherever. They're just hyper intelligent. And, and I feel like the crew can also be hyper intelligent sometime and, 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 and know what is needed to give exactly what you're talking about, that guest experience. So kind of the phrase that I came up with and I could run up past you on this podcast and see what you think is like, yachting is not a transportation business. It's a hospitality business. And that's a very big distinction. So when you start leaving out the service areas, which are uh, laundry, pantries, galleys, and I want to put tender garages in there too, because that's a busy area of the boat, you know, in, in a lot of programs. And, and, and I think to not have crew involved in those areas that are gonna be the hotbeds of all action of giving the guests the best experience that crew possibly can. And, and that's what we're trying to do. And they get overlooked 
and a bunch of equipments get thrown into a box and they're like, well, why don't you like it? They're like, well, 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 I know. I know. How many reasons do you want? But, um, but, but Brenna, I'd like to add some area to that because I think yeah. I think pools pools are underrated. They're not they're not utilized mm. in a way that they could. But what about a bar? We all know that yeah. the bar is an essential place. They are beautiful features, but they're not practical features. And they can be both. They can be beautiful and practical. Right. Um, and most of the times they don't get used. And because well, they're in they, a weird they spot. They're not in the right spot. Exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, or, or how I think another and, one and I would love your one, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say I'd love to add one more, which I know you would love, is the barbecue. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Why not create the best, beautiful, amazing barbecue area that is actually guest inviting and not just yeah. creating a space where the chef is with the back to the guests and all that? It's like, <laughs> come on, it's not an hour. Yeah. And this is something I came in, so I'm, I can't say the name of the boat or the yard, but let's say it's 130 meter plus. I was in the position where I was able to like 3D design, you know, my, my fantasy Tapanaki station, but a lot of the practicality came into that. Like, where is it on the boat? Oh, is it, is it open air? No, there's a deck above it. All right, well, there needs to be a hood system above it. Like, well, that's going to affect the looks of the, of the, of the deck head. Well, that's better than a burnt deck head, isn't it? Like, you still have to prepare for fire. Like, this is a safety feature. And it's just like, you're, you're kind of, I think they're more and more open to listening to crew now, but and I understand why they, they don't. I think it affects their bottom line. And, and they're not building these boats for free, but I don't think they make a ton of money on these. I mean, they're all relative speaking, of course. I don't think there's massive margins. So I, I understand. You involve crew, things get more expensive, but you're also improving the yacht's reputation. Your yacht, your line of yacht, whatever it is, yeah. your reputation gets better because you design, design a perfect pool area. You design a perfect barbecue pit where the owner is proud, the crew is proud. You didn't design a bad galley or a bad service area. We're just ripping through crew because the owner is going to live on board and have 25 guests and the crew are like, I can't, why? I was on a, a 30 meter that was designed wow. better, you know, in terms of layout. So that, I think that's that's one of the things that, I, that I've notice where you get to these like money's no object boats where why why did you do that <laughs> of all things oh and i want to run this phrase by you too because this is what you get and i'm sure you get it as well because it could be interior managers chief stews whatever it's like well all chefs are different so they basically cancel us all out where like because i'm like i know we're all different that's a good thing we, we we're supposed to be different but I bet all of us different chefs could design a better galley than a captain, an engineer, even a design company, because it's our craft. We do it every day. Whereas like these people that build boats, as smart as they are, have never worked a day of their life on a yacht. And there's a huge disconnect there that I don't understand. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because uh, me being in Holland and basically living around the shipyards. I mean, you know, yeah. we, we, we do interact with them a lot. Um, and it's getting more and more because like you say, it is changing. 10 years ago, they were not really willing, but now they started to embrace the whole customer service aspect. And the customer service mm. aspect is not just for the owner, it's for the captain, for the crew, you know, enjoying shipyard times in Holland for refits and bits. Um, so things, things are changing there and shipyards are definitely uh, willing to to take on advice and I think what, what I find interesting and I don't know if you've experienced this but I've had captains over the last well 10 years reach out to me and say Peter can you look at the specs and at the GAs and give me your honest feedback on what the shipyard is proposing to me right and that's what that's the time it needs that, to be done is the original GA it has to be done then otherwise it's too late it's the time for it has to be done on, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I well, just want to point I out, find like, interesting. it has to be on that first GA. Otherwise, it's too late. Well, but don't you think it's interesting that a captain has to come to you or me to ask for feedback, whilst it should really be the shipyard asking us? Yeah, agreed. Yeah. So it's an option. You know, it's like and that option is usually not explored. Yeah, that's an interesting. Not yet, uh, but I, th I think, I think if we're five years from now, that it will change. It will. Yeah, I, I think I think it will. I, I feel it. Like I just feel the need is there, and and then, um, yeah, 
and, and my, my experience quite recently within the last uh, year or so dealing with uh, some of the best yards in Northern Europe is that they are open to it. They are, you just have to get your foot in the right door to be able to you know, give your opinion and, and, and try to build a galley that's not for you, but a galley that's just gonna work, that has flow, that's got like clockwise flow, food comes in, gets prepped, gets cooked, it goes out. Like it's just, and the dish pit, like I always set our galleys around the dish pit, like the dish pit's the busiest part, where is that gonna go? Because that's hugely important. And the things that get proposed, yeah. uh, and I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna slam anybody, but I would love to like just display some GAs and just, this is why, this won't work, this won't work, this won't work, this won't work. It's, 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 yeah. I think it's gonna change though, Peter. I think you're right, I think it has to. Well, you know, maybe a little bit more even. And things have changed. And I think that uh, everybody's starting to understand that uh, if someone buys a 60 meter boat today, he might in five years, three years from now, four years from now, might order that next 80 meter or 90 meter. Yeah. It is it is just what happens. We all know the owners, there's only a handful. And that's what with a shipyard, uh, with an owner, with a captain, that's what the focus should be. The focus is changing from being a um, builder to being a service provider. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. And I not only see that, I not only see that at shipyards, I see that at management companies, I see it at uh, suppliers, in you know, even even the paint or uniforms or whatever. They're all starting to realize they are in service. They're not in anything yeah. else. Right. It, it's true. It, it, it's completely true. It, provisioners are another one. It's like I go with the provisioner that gives me the best service because like that becomes like your your right hand man or woman while you're like so busy. Can you give me the caviar? Can you give me the bonito flakes right from Japan? Like, you know, it becomes a service rather than just a bottom line. You give know, it to like, me you know, now. Yeah, I needed it. I'm sorry. Like, and it's always apologetic because it's never like me. It's always like the <laughs> guest just asked for it. Like, can you can you do it? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a funny, uh, but I, I do. I do feel that shift coming. Like you said, like, it's not about, well, I said transport, but you said, uh, design or um kind of shipping and it's 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 all about the service and of course we're going to say that obviously we're biased you know we're in the service industry we started our careers as young men in the service industry but that's what they come for they come to be pampered and it is like the best holiday you could ever imagine where just, just everything is done for you the, the toys the exploration the food the drinks the pool incredible it's 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 fun to be part of that it's fun to give that service and think outside the box and, and and come up with new stuff but uh that kind of creative thinking is really hard to do when you're a little bit crippled by a poorly designed uh you know laundry room pantry galley pool tender garage yeah i think tender garages too like i see those guys like guys and girls on the deck team just killing themselves trying to get toys in and out in a certain time pack them away boats moving it's hectic and it gets a little bit dangerous. Like <laughs> it gets a bit nuts. Yeah, it does. It does. I actually think tender garages are an opportunity to make life really, really smart, and, yeah. and to build in re refrigerating and um, service areas, fridges, and all that is just even a, even a washing machine. You know, not one or two, but just set it up properly. Get yeah. it done so that it actually helps the guys on deck, that it helps yeah. the team on deck, right? Um, yep. And not, not just because it will make their life easier. No, it will be it will provide you a better service on the tender. It will provide you a better service on the beach. It will provide. I mean, it is it is proven. I mean, by now, after all these years, the service around the 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 the, the, the deck department that they need to provide to get a width, you know, interior is just so obvious and. It can be it can be done really really well if you just think it through. Yeah, I, I agree, and and that's where I think during a build on our first GA is like get get a current like first officer in there, you know nothing wrong with the you know experienced captain, but get someone in there that's like, you know that can really lay that out perfectly. Like I wouldn't have thought of the washer and probably a dryer in in the in the tender bay to get the towels just hammered out quickly without having to traipse them through the boat to find the laundry room wherever that is and 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 provide that service because i keep talking about make things easier for crew or um now i want to i want to put a caveat in there. Our, the reason um, i say that connection is starting to 
I know, man. I know. It's because the coffee shop's filling up. I think, well, it's not too bad. Uh, we'll we'll do the best we can, Gorilla. It's okay. It's okay. I'm still testing it, but it's <laughs> slightly challenging. <laughs> yeah, same. same some, you, you froze once, but luckily only once. Um, what I was saying about, I want to caveat for people that are watching that aren't crew, is that when I want to, when I want to make things easier, it's because a lot of times we're working 18-hour days. Like, look, to, to make things easier means we get more rest to provide better service, to be uh, more smiley, to, to have these new ideas and these kind of like fun things to do with a guest with a scavenger hunt. I'm not so, you any moment. Oh, no, damn it. I don't know what to do. Let's see if there's another network I'm on there. Hello, welcome back to Get the Fork Out. Uh, we have Peter Vogel again. Technical difficulties on my end, so we lost connection. That is life uh, on the yeah, run, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always kind of moving, so a lot of Wi-Fi is going to be shoddy, so I apologize to both Peter and whoever's watching how shitty the last connection was, but this, is, this should be way better, and we can just continue with lucid thoughts about the industry. Yes. Oh, cool. welcome back, Peter. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. I mean, look, I, I, I admire you for your patience and your calmness around, uh, I guess, the challenges you must be facing when you travel the way you do. <laughs> it's, it's my own doing, so I can only get mad at myself, really. But it's, it's, it's for a good cause. I feel like it's, uh, yeah, I just, I, I like constant change. And it keeps me excited. It keeps me motivated. But yeah, it's a pain in the ass when you're every morning, you're trying to find Wi-Fi. Like that's part of your day and that's that's not fun. So it's over now. It's fixed. It's resolved. I was uploading like crazy last night to catch back up. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think where we uh, left off. Uh, I think the, the last question, which is probably the biggest and a very interesting one, that one that you brought up prior to recording. And um, I think that's a great one. And it's the discrepancy between uh the blacks and the whites that you call them the front of the house and the back of the house the chefs uh the wait staff and and i believe you pointed out earlier too is that the same thing happens in restaurants and how can we address it on yachts and i think that's where we left off yeah. you're right that that is where we left off and to be honest it's a it's such an interesting topic in my opinion um back Agreed. in the day and I, I mean as you know when i was I came into yachting in 97. Um, it was a topic then, right? And it's still a topic. Um, yeah. I think, I, th I don't think many, many things have changed. I mean, if you, if you look at it and I'd love to get your opinion on this, I mean, you, you're being the chef side, me being the interior side, um, the chefs have trained all their lives to become the chef that they are. Um, they put a whole bunch of chefs together in a team and basically they have been training and training and developing themselves to be, you know, as good as they are, as creative, as, as skilled, as experienced, you know. And then I know the challenge on yachts is that we, as developed as you would find on, in a hotel or a cruise ship for that matter. So we've got a disbalance, you know, you've got really well developed, trained, uh, passionate chefs, and you've got passionate interior crew that just do not have the same development behind them. They do not have that hospitality. And I'm wondering, I mean, I just wonder, I know I talk to a lot of chefs about this, but I'd love to hear your opinion about that gap and, and how, to, how to bring it closer together again when you experience it. Um, <clears throat> you took a lot of the words out, out of my out of my mouth. I think a lot of discrepancies on, on yachts, as opposed to restaurants, because I think it's a little bit worse on yachts, where you have uh, staff that don't know much about food, uh, don't know much about service, maybe don't even enjoy fine dining in their free time, and and that's obviously the worst case scenario. There's that's not the norm, um, but there is exactly what you said a, a massive gap between people that have put. Um, years if not decades into their craft handing their creations over to someone that that can't describe a certain type of cheese that's quite common it, it's that's just a one time example and and, and it, it's just it's, it's really frustrating for me and, and i've been doing it a long time as i've reiterated many times i'm sure people here sick of hearing me say it but it gets to a point where you just get like 
you know, there's that passionate point where you, where you and this is, this is my problem too, and I'm, I'm, you know, hanging my ass out here, but it's true and it's something I need to work on, is that you get tired. You get tired of building people up and knowledge and then they leave and then they just leave the industry and they're not even in hospitality anymore. And it just becomes like this, this cyclical effect for a chef in my example that's been doing it for so long. And that's bad. I, I'm not saying this is a good thing. I need to get back on the and just this is my team, build them up and and teach them as much as I possibly can what I know in a nice way, in a productive way, so they can retain the knowledge. Um, I think the you asked what can we do about it, and I think we're doing it. I think we're, we're talking about it. But we're we're instead of just sweeping it on the rug, oh that chef's a dick or or that that stew is useless. Um, talk about it go out of our way to train, you know, do stuff in the galley to teach people about food. And you know, I, I can't say I'm bad at that. I have done that. It's really fun. Like crossings and stuff. We do risotto, uh, sourdough. We do um, this, this really easy, like banging flour chocolate cake, like just these easy recipes. And it really connects people that sometimes aren't connected at all with food. Some people don't even cook food. And that, I think that will help build the teamwork that, understanding of what it takes and, and what goes into some of this stuff and, and i think that's for the chef that's the most disheartening part is that you spend hours if not days building each day with, with something some sort of fermentation or some sort of brining and and then or slow cooking with sous vide and then you hand it off to someone that doesn't even give a shit and, and that's the yeah, hardest yeah. part that for, for, and, and i'm sure you and, and that's not always the case but oftentimes it is. And that's, for me, that's, that's the most disheartening part. So that's my long-winded answer to your question. That's, that's where I'm at with it. No, but, but, but to be honest, your, your, your experience is similar to the ones that I experience when I'm out there on these boats and working with both teams, because I don't think it should be a galley team or an interior team. You've got a hospitality team, right? Yeah. Agreed. You've got to deliver, yeah. you've got to deliver something exceptional that is created by chefs um but then once the chefs have created it you kind of let it go and pass it on like you said and it has to go to the table in the way that you know extends that that level of experience and that level of knowledge which is not always the case so what you just said i think is fantastic is, is the awareness that it is different and almost as yeah. far as going to say the acceptance <laughs> that that's what yachting is about. Even though we're claiming it's seven stars and it's the best out there in the world, we both yeah. know that it takes a hell of a lot of time and a hell of a lot of talking and, 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 and being real with each other about the difference and just being yeah. honest, just saying it is what it is. How do we fix it so that we can actually deliver that incredible experience to the owners and the charter guests? Uh, agreed. And it's, uh, it's that team building. It, it depends on the program as well. Is there time to, to do this team building stuff? Because a lot of programs are so busy that there's no time. Um, but regardless, it's, it's so hugely important. The, the workaround that I've done is to just deliver the food myself. And, and thankfully, <laughs> that's acceptable in, in, in this industry in certain circumstances. And you got to read the crowd. Some, some people don't want to see the chef. Like they're not interested in talking to you. And other people are just like, yes, tell us what went into the dish. Um, that, that helps a lot. And that's part of the service. That's almost another, I mean, that's almost another conversation because that's not really helping the situation really. It's just kind of a workaround in terms of, you know, what, this is what I put into it. Here it is. I'm available if you want to continue to ask questions at the table. Or, or I'll leave. And, and that is, I think that is something that comes along with experience too. You gotta be able to read the room. Some people don't want you there. They're not interested. And then and other people are just like, wow, we got a chef right here. Let's, let's talk to him. Let's ask him all these questions. It'll be one or two people at the table that'll just hit you every meal. But I don't think that addresses the problem. Does it Peter? <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't. And it does in a way, because I, I know that when I, when I would be the one kind of, you know, be your counterpart, right? You're the chef. I'm the interior manager, yeah. chief steward, as, sorry, chief steward. <laughs> um, but, but, <laughs> I don't know, slip of the tongue there. Um, but when, <laughs> when, when we would be, when we would be together, you know, and that's, I've worked with so many chefs, female or male, doesn't matter. Um, you know, you build something like that in. It's an experience to bring the chef out. It's an experience to let the chef talk from his heart or her heart and really talk about 
um, the service. But I wonder, and, and this is a question for you, another question I've always wanted to ask is, you know, not only do you have a passion for the food, I know you do have also a passion for the way this is then uh, experienced by the guest at the table. There yeah. must be a link. There must be a way that whatever it is that you envision, you want to translate it to the interior team somehow. And and there's not always time for it, like you said. Sometimes it's just, yeah. you know, you're just thrown into the mix and you just have to make it work. So, I mean, can you talk about, I, I'm just interested, can you talk about the passion for you to say it is an A to Z journey. It's a, you know, I'm creating it, but I, I'm not satisfied till it's actually delivered. <laughs> right, I, I, I like how you're asking me questions. This is a, this is good. This is, you, I'm getting interviewed. Oh, sorry, like sorry, I'm so used to this shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I love it because it's um, we're, we're getting it out there. We're communicating. We're I, I think we're trying to pick each other's brains. How do we make this better? And and that's that, those are valuable conversations. Yeah, A to so an A to Z from you know from basically from from the provisioner into the walk-in to the plate and 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 I think I don't have an answer other than. The, the easy thing is just to go out yourself and, and and try to relay the time and effort and thought that went into something that you made. But then, like, I mean, it would be how do we how do we re envision that? What does that look like with all the with all the the the, uh, the service staff involved? What does that look like? What kind of presentation? I mean, I think the easiest thing or the the smart thing to do would be to put ourselves as guests, you know, in those seats. And would we what what kind of amazing service? on a yacht versus a Michelin star restaurant or a fine dining restaurant or a casual restaurant, what would we, you and I, as the insiders, what would we want to see? What would be good service to us? And it mm. could, I mean, we could re-envision the whole thing. <laughs> well, I we guess could. I just put a question back at you. <laughs> yeah, you did, you did. <laughs> but, but, but I think you're right. I think it, so the, the key, I think, to creating seven star service instead of six or five, six being normally related to cruise ships, five being hotels, seven stars, supposedly yachting is what we were being told. Right? Really? Um, I, didn't, I didn't know to, there was distinctions. Oh, apparently there is. I mean, I'm just repeating what I've been told. So, you know, I okay, good. Know you didn't make it up so we can make fun of it a little no, bit. No, no, God, well, so no, 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 no. I'm not making anything <laughs> up. <laughs> so what, what's a three Michelin star then? Because to me, that's the highest service that there is. But I could well, be wrong. I don't know. Well, and that's interesting because I think three Michelin star, you know, we both have experienced it. We both enjoy it. It's interesting. It's different. And it's not mm -hmm. what you see. I don't think every yacht does go to that level. I think most or, yachts, or even half it. Might, there's not a lot of need well, for it most of the time. Well, exactly, exactly. Although I'm still thinking that if you if you're able to deliver a three star Michelin service, that that is if you if you just take away the whole madness around the food and all that um what we do on yachts is is comparable i mean we are mental yeah. we're completely lost if yeah. you think about the way we the way we want to interpret an owner's or a charter guest's wishes we are going behind their world without them knowing we're trying to be sherlock holmes and and discover um, as much as we can about these people so that we can deliver based on their habits and their preferences and all that. Yeah. We have more time on a yacht than anyone in a Michelin star restaurant ever has. Because in a Michelin star restaurant, True. you have maybe four, five, six hours together. We have a week, maybe two weeks, maybe even if it's an owner, yeah. sometimes some months. So we are, we, we are, how do you say that? It, we owe it to the owner or the charter guest to be better. To do better. I agree. To, we have more information. We do. And I think information is key here. I, I agree. And this is one of the caveats that I put out to people. I, I'm, I'm not jumping tracks. So it's directly in line is that, you know, imagine going to a resort for one week, two weeks, three weeks, and eating at the same restaurant, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, and, and that's the, the tricky part of what we do. With all the advantages that you just mentioned, the tricky part is the repetitiveness, the monotony that we combat against because I don't know about you, but I wouldn't go to a resort and eat the same restaurant or, or a hotel. You know, I, I want to explore food. And, and that's what yeah. we're trying to do with food and service on a yacht is like to change it up. We have to have all these different, but so given all that information, 
we still have to do a lot more with that information than providing the regimented discipline service of a three mission star day in and day out of the same relatively same menus um anyway i hope i didn't jump tracks too far uh but i agree with you i've never thought of it in that way is that how much information we do have versus a hotel restaurant it's an, it's amazing we should be able to do more with it well and and and, and i'd love to bring back this this question i asked earlier about you know the blacks and the whites i mean don't yeah. take me wrong i think I think in the interior there are some amazing foodies, and when when you have a foodie yeah. op opposite a chef, right? When you have a proper foodie oh, on the interior, so much side, easier. Ah oh, man, I mean, if, even if they don't, even if they've not been educated, they're foodies. They get it. They yeah. love it. They want to. <laughs> they love it. They're, they're going to ask questions. They're going to go for it. They're going to be excited. They're going to they're going to taste stuff and make crazy noises and 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 and. Rather than the robot that just picks up, drops off. Like, if <laughs> if they get asked a question, they get bothered by it. Like, or they're so scared and nervous because yeah. they know they don't know shit, and and it's just like it makes us all look bad. And, and I, I think that's where I think that's where you come in with training as well. Like, to to build up a team from the outside and and just get communication going and and make sure that the 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 chefs are talking to the stews or the service staff and just moving, just opening lines of communication, because I think it'd be challenging, like for a captain to organize that, or even the chief uh, stew, steward, chef. I think in certain situa situations that would be challenging and it'd be, it'd be much more beneficial to have someone come in from the outside. It's in, interesting you bring that up because uh, obviously I've been, you know, on the inside, right? I've been a chief steward and interior manager and all that stuff. Uh, we would still always invest in the external party to come in because if I'm telling my team that I want something, they're like, it's it's my chief stew telling me. But if there is an external right. party coming in saying, look, this is based on international standards or the trends that we exactly. see out there, or, yeah. you know, they're it's like, the industry okay, telling we'll me. do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's rather the, 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 not the head of the department telling me, it's the industry standards that we're learning that can be re reiterated outside of this job. And I think, yeah, that's way more powerful in terms of training. Yeah. You know, I mean, we've both been in it so long that when I kicked off, um, there wasn't really any kind of onboard training. You could go to Blue Water back in the day and actually train with their interior people, which was nice because no one, no one else was doing anything. Obviously, now it's completely tra uh, transitioned and the whole industry has gone, OK, onboard training. It doesn't matter if it's interior or, for that matter, a whole team or deck or whatever, safety. Um, it's actually useful to do it in the work environment. And, yeah. and to work, you know, to not just come on board. I, I've had this before where a captain would be like, can you please just work with my girls? Already the word girls doesn't really sit well with me because, you know, they have a job. They're stewardesses or stewards. Um, but then when you right. start working with the, when you only work with the interior and the galley is not involved, you know, I, I, I can only do so much, but when, when yeah. there's a collaboration between the galley and the interior and, and you not only do the, the theoretical, but you're starting to get practical and you, you know, you simulate and you get like role play and you get the whole damn thing going like it's real. That's when you make a difference. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It's it's getting everyone involved. Everyone, I don't think locked in is the right word, but at least invested in the process going forward. A, a real quick example, we had uh, a couple of very talented bartenders do a, uh, a cool uh, drinks course with some of the owner's family while on board. And, you know, they asked if the galley was being one of the involved. I'm like, of course, like, this is great. Well, we all love cocktails, food and beverage. Like, this is awesome. But it was so fun to talk about pairing with the um, with the with the bartenders and, and with the with the, the stewardesses on board, and just get the kind of the juices flowing. Like, yeah, this is how this is how we can all work together to provide something special. And 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 a lot of for the unfortunately, I, I don't keep one harping on the negative, but for a lot of these these um, stewardesses who are amazing and, and really funny girls that are hilarious to work with. Um, sorry, not girls, uh, uh, professionals. Uh, a lot of them don't know that much about bartending, food pairing, all that stuff. So it was kind of fun to teach a little and 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 
kind of watch the wheels turn. I'm like, oh yeah, if I eat this while I drink that, holy shit, that's a whole nother experience rather than just the drinking and, and not thinking about the eating. Um, so anyway, anyway, that was the, I, I agree with you. You have to have the team work together to, and we're all pushing in the exact same direction. <laughs> and it's that idea. I really like your idea of like A to Z, like from, from the provisioner, from the time it hits the dock into the, the hands of the crew, into the walk-in, up to the galley, prepped, cooked, served. That's a whole process and everyone's invested in that. That's an important concept. I'm keeping that, man. <laughs> Definitely. Hey, you know. It... <laughs> <laughs> That's why you get paid the big bucks for training. That was it. Those concepts. That's, I love it. <laughs> that's because I'll give it to you for free, man. <laughs> Thanks, dude. <laughs> no, but, but, but awesome. you know, it's interesting you bring this up because back in the day, um, you know, I think it's also the drive of the individual. So if you have a great chef on board and you have a great interior chief steward, chief stewardess, and, and you've got some really passionate people. Um, at the end of the day, you know, and this is one thing I really feel is, 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 is sometimes not understood. The chief steward or chief stewardess does not need to know everything. You no. bring in people into the team that have um, a passion for wine and a passion for cocktails and a passion for whatever. You know, the chief steward is only there to coordinate all that. Once you bring right. it all together, train each other, like you were just saying, that training yeah. element of, of the owners, it is, it is the most <coughs> enticing and, and, and exciting part of the job. We all know that the best time is when you have guests on board. At least in my world, it was always about having them on board because then I can showcase what we can do as a team. How can we wow them? How can we do better? Um, yeah. But the time in between was to be used to develop. If you don't develop in between, if you do a refit without developing, I'm sorry, you yeah. are walking back. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And I feel very lucky. I think I'm in that situation now on Arians where it's there's money for that because a lot of programs, there's no understanding or money for that or a private boat with a very simple owner that's like, why bother? But I think in, yeah. the, in the upper echelons of the industry, there's there should be and has to be budgeted categories for training while on board you know not not necessarily when you're off board you know when you're off the boat of course that too but as a team on the boat not shipping out to somewhere and but like let's do it on board let's let's spend the money to hire the professionals to come in i think that's um that's massive and then i see it i've seen it before but just recently with the cocktail training how much more professional and everyone is and, and they're doing they're doing practice rounds you know at, at the end of the days on fridays and every once in a while a cocktail will come down to the galley and, and jaleel and i'll split it because we're still cooking and uh it's just fun I, I love that i love the uh what it brings to the entire boat exterior as well everyone got into it yeah i don't know where i was going with that but <laughs> and then i killed a guy <laughs> no i didn't kill interesting what you're saying because you know, honestly, um, if we go back 20 years ago, uh, we had no internet. So, yeah. you know, we would bring professionals to inspire us and bring the trends to the boat. These days, you have internet. And yes, you can get anything from a YouTube channel. And that's cool. I actually, yeah. I watch pretty much YouTube channels every day, every day, just to learn something new. Um, I do too. But it's not, it's not the exact same thing as having someone come on board which, for example, I mean, we're going into specialism lately. Um, we got this like incredible tea specialist. The guy spent I don't know how much time in Sri Lanka. He's come out of there and he's like, I can combine this to mocktails and cocktails, and I can I can do so much more now with the knowledge around tea. That, yeah. You know, five years ago or ten years ago, we wouldn't even have thought about it. We were happy to be able to make a margarita. Yeah. Yeah, right. and now it's another tool. It's another tool in the arsenal of like wowing people, like a matcha cocktail or a, yeah, tea leaves from Darjeeling, like whole tea leaves, and, and those are brewed and chilled and then freaked out into a cool like you know, paired with lavender and uh, it's yeah, it's it's and that like you said that that knowledge, just to even know that knowledge exists, you need the internet, and then it's like we'll find the specialist and get them on board and let, let let's talk about it. Yeah, I like that. I like that analogy where, and also uh, not to keep going back to this cocktail training, but, and this goes into what we talked about before about um, service areas on, on new builds and how uh, not thought about they are by, by the people that work in them. 
So there's a very small pantry on Ariens. And so the bartenders came on and they wanted to have this huge, you know, perfect like bar set up. And, and um, I don't know if the girl said anything before I came up, but I was like, you know, there's going to be, in addition to this bar setup, about 17 empty plates or full platters up here at the same time because the bar setup took up the whole countertop. So then we come back to the topic of doing the training on board. And so that the, actually the, the people that you're bringing in, that you're paying, can see the situation and then like, reassess the situation because it can't be their way. It has to be the way of, the physical constraints of this particular vessel, this particular room, and the guests will be directly that way on this deck and they'll be eating at the same time as you have this massive bar set up. So it's not practical. What, what else can we do? I think that's hugely important too, rather than going to some sort of academy where there's a bar set up and it's all nice and neat, but then the girls are yeah. gonna be like, well, what the fuck do we do with that information? That's, that doesn't translate at all to what we do every day. Not, not even close. Well, it's interesting because we we obviously have our bartending specialists and all that guys, and these guys have done parties on board boats. They have done service board boats. They've been on board boats, and it's interesting because every time that they're trying to translate something, they they speak to a chief stew who's challenged by space or by um, uh, availability or you know about time or you know all of that. And and the the, the only way to really translate is to actually have someone who's been on board who's been a crew member who actually gets it and then developed further and it just seems yeah. to work yeah i agree i think that's that's hugely important the training on board and um yeah there, there's a market for it it's just I, I do think um the busier boats it's hard to find the time to fit it in that's the hard part like you talk about a dual season charter boat to fit in you know the, the two massive bookends of the seasons of summer and winter um all the crossings yard periods crew time off because a lot of um a lot of crew aren't, aren't on rotation uh it's just it's just hard to fit it in a busy boat that's the challenging part even boats you know, with big budgets that have budgets for the crew it's like well when the hell do you do it when do you fit it well, in but that's really interesting that you bring that part up because obviously i've been on both sides right so i know how busy we all are and i know how challenging it is to fit it in um one of the things and one of the trends i see now is um that a lot of things are going online as you know virtual blended uh, on demand um and that's exactly yeah. where we've been going because what you can do once you go blended and once you go virtual you can actually shorten your time on board as a as a professional right because they do people do a lot of pre reading they do a lot of pre-testing they do a lot of but we work together not only with uh, the individual but also with their leaders or the chiefs too or whatever and then you come on board for instead of like in the old days five days you only come on board for two days or maybe one yeah. day and it's still exciting because they build up online and they do their like journey or whatever you call that they, they basically go through the motion and then it's a much shorter visit which is a cheaper uh so more economical uh. Uh, same time it still helps the individual to feel like they're aiming to something new something like growth something that's going to give yeah. them a certificate something that's going to help them in their yeah. career and that's we love that's certificates the, yeah we all do right yeah. <laughs> yeah we love it it's a little like tick box it feels good i got a piece of paper it's going on with a resume yeah. uh I, I agree though that, that does sound like the future and it, and it you'll it'll be funny I, I, as you were talking i'm like yeah it'll be funny to pick out the bad students and the good students you know the ones that have done the the coursework before the pro uh, shows up i think that but we know we uh, know. makes sense though we it's a good idea <laughs> i'll say, say it again you, you broke up a little bit so saying we know exactly who did what before we get there <laughs> i bet you do i bet you do yeah um yeah, this is uh thanks for coming on the show, Peter. This has been epic. I'm sorry about the uh, having to do it over two days. My bad. Life on the run. Uh, but yeah, it's been very, very valuable. Let's let's do it again in a, a month or two and reassess as we're in the season and uh, when we get some free time. But I think, um, like you pointed out earlier, just just opening this communication and talking about it. And this is actually of all the things we talked about. I think we talked longest about getting the the front and the back of the house involved together pointed in the same direction and that i mean that could be we could talk about that for hours i think um i think we should i, I think agree. we should in a, in a month or so if you're, if you're willing to come back to get the fork out 
I, man, absolutely. I mean, I absolutely love this. I think, I think just talking about it is going to open up conversations around it between staff, uh, chefs and, and stewardesses on board these boats. And at the end of the day, that's only yeah. going to help the industry. That's going to create better service. It's going to create better experiences. So yeah, 100%. If you want me back, I'll be back. That, definitely. And definitely. And one more, one more point on that, like not just the chefs and the, in the interior staff, but also management and captains being like, Oh yeah. Like it's going to re- it's going to like fit well with certain people that, that, that watch this and listen to these sort of conversations that like, Oh, it's, this is worth the money. I'm, I'm, you know, this sounds like a waste of money. I got a chief stew. What do I need? It's like, nah, it's, it's, there's more to it than that. There's a lot more to it than that. So, um, again, I mean, I want to uh, promote your, your, uh, LH luxury hospitality. That's, that you're, you're what Thank you've you. been doing uh, at a high level for a long time on some of the best programs in the industry. It's, it's quite inspiring. Um, thank you for coming, uh, to my, my humble podcast and, uh, passing on some, some free knowledge to, to me and uh, whoever's watching. <laughs> Appreciate it, Peter. Uh, thanks. Thanks again. You know, um, uh, anytime that I can share, um, you know, passion at the end of the day, both of us have the same passion, the industry, is amazing it's given me and i think you a great life and i it think has. that a lot of people um unaware of you know how how i think most of us are very grateful for the fact that we rolled into this industry when we were younger and yep. it's you know created a way forward it's created a path that you know i don't think i could have thought of when i was 21 years old and it's amazing it's um it's something I'd love to pay forward, and I really, really believe that our industry is up for you know so much more, so much, so much good that we can do. Um, but it's only if we start communicating. I I, I agree. Um, I'm I'm very thankful for my time in this industry and the, and the life it has afforded me with you know among other things, but directly pointing at you know riding my motorcycle around the world like that's that is an unachievable financial dream for a lot of people to have the disposable income and disposable time and not have to sell off everything. Um, and what that has given me and I've brought back into the industry or sorry, into the, whatever galley that I'm on, it's, uh, it's intense. And I feel very thankful like you, like I, I couldn't have my younger self dreaming of, of all the things that I've done in my 20 years in the industry. And, and at this point, uh, I've noticed with the podcast uh, and also with the YouTube channel is that I've become a, a, a beacon for new people getting into the industry and i didn't know that was going to be my role or part of my role but i'm happy to fill it if that makes sense i didn't i didn't that wasn't the intention but i'm like right, well people help me you know wh- why not it's my turn it's my role as someone that's uh, i call myself a senior in the industry and in, in og it's uh, i'm humble for for everything that i've gotten and, and I'm, I'm happy to give back i, I have to it's owed yeah. Listen, honestly, um, uh, I hope you're getting to Europe soon so we can actually meet in person. But otherwise, you know, yeah. I'm happy to come back. Home. And um, yeah, looking, looking forward to uh, what's coming up for you next. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thanks again for, uh, for taking the time and your schedule and, and all this crazy uh, Wi Fi bullshit. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate you. And uh, let's do it again soon. Absolutely. Take care. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, right, man. See you later. Bye. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Peter Vogel. Apologize for the uh, the Wi-Fi. It's resolved. Never again. Bullshit. That will probably almost definitely happen again because I'm recording somewhere new almost every single episode, which is fun. I'm not complaining, but it adds challenges, which are, uh, well, you've seen them. Next up... Uh, we are going to have my friend Penelope. She is a sweetheart and she's a very knowledgeable industry a professional. She is right behind me. I am hiding her. Again, sweetheart. Look at those teeth. Um, that's obviously bullshit. Penelope doesn't really talk much anymore. Um, I don't know who I'm going to have next. Uh, I think it's going to be my chef friend Peter. But... To be confirmed, stay tuned. Uh, love the chef chats. Love all these chats, actually. I, I learned so much. I appreciate all these people I have um, on this podcast. Peter and I will talk about... Peter's on the chef on Mad Summer. Massive charter boat. Uh, I can say that boat's name. Um, and we can talk 
quite openly about what it's like to be a charter chef and anything else, anything else that comes up uh, between Peter, myself, and sweet little purring Penelope. Yeah. Um, I have to say this. Please like and subscribe to the channel. It helps the channel grow. It helps in a number of different ways. I know every YouTuber says that. I don't even know if I am a YouTuber. I'd rather be a content creator, whatever. Um, but please like and subscribe. It helps. And comment. They can be lewd. Please leave off-color comments. Um, that does help a lot. Thanks. Hope you liked it.